good to see everybody this morning. Special welcome to those of you joining us online if you're checking out a recording of this later on down the road. I trust that everybody's New Year's is off to a great start, that you're holding fast to all of those resolutions. And I know when I say that, I get that look from many of you, because resolutions, sometimes they kind of like hit us in hard ways. Um, but you know, a few years back, someone gave me a different way of thinking about resolutions that I just want to share with you. You know, too often we resolve to do something in a year, and then by about the middle of that first month, we're like just getting crushed. Like we just can't keep up with it, right? So we kind of throw our hands in the air and we just quit. But rather than do it that way, what if we instead looked at 2023 as the year that we're going to work on that resolution so that by the end of that year, we might actually be able to do the thing we've resolved to do in our lives, and then that would just be part of our lives from then on. So that's what was pitched to me uh, many years ago or so, and I've sort of grasped onto that. And as I look back from year to year, I find that God is using that as a sanctification process in many ways because I'm praying about that resolution. I'm in Scripture about that resolution. And it's really been helpful to me personally. So if you haven't made resolutions yet this year, or you've already given up on the one you did make, you're, you've, you've chosen wisely coming to church today because the Apostle Paul is going to give us all some really cool resolutions for us to work on today. So we'll keep that in mind as we jump into this, but before we do, and before I tell you what those resolutions are, I want to make sure that we all have the necessary context for this passage. As Cammie mentioned, we kicked off our study uh, of Ephesians back in May, and it took us a long time just to finish those first three chapters that were all about belief. And now we're starting into behavior. And you can kind of see up there on those graphics that these are some of the topics we learned in belief in blue, and then some of the stuff we're going to cover in behavior in orange. But what we're going to find is that belief and behavior are intrinsically linked. So while we're in behavior, we're going to keep reaching back to the belief portion because you simply can't separate them. If you believe a bridge will hold, you'll cross it. If you believe the water isn't safe to drink, you won't drink it. So they're intrinsically linked. In fact, you know, we try to make everything in our worship services kind of hang together. And I asked Abby, she does our lighting, um, come up with some graphic on the walls that can help us kind of remember this. And she does this almost every week. So actually, I would encourage you when you come in each week, just take a look at what's on the walls. There's something there, right? And so we've got a little triangle here to remind us of belief internally. What is it that we believe? And then, of course, that little triangle then translates itself outwardly to what we behave. That's pretty good, isn't it? I thought that was pretty good too. So um, anyway, but just a reminder, we cannot separate what we believe with how we behave. And that is perhaps why Paul uses such a strong transition to connect chapters one through three with chapters four through six. He transitions from belief to behavior by writing, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now that word, therefore, is our focus. It's a powerful transition because it is essentially a prompt for us to follow on with some kind of response. It's a call to action in light of what we believe, therefore, we must respond. In light of election. God choosing us in him before the foundation of the world to be his adopted children, heirs of his kingdom, in light of redemption, our assurance of salvation by grace through faith, in light of being strengthened by the Holy Spirit so that Christ in all of his supremacy dwells in our hearts, in light of being rooted and grounded in love, in light of being filled to all the fullness of God. In light of all that we just professed to believe when we recited the Apostles' Creed and then sang the song about the Apostles' Creed afterwards. In light of all of that, therefore, Paul urges us to walk in a manner worthy of this calling right here, worthy of all of those in light of us. You see, we didn't just happen upon Christianity it's not just a decision we made in a pew one day. It's so much more than that. It's a calling from God. 
the creator and sustainer of the universe, a call to his adopted children. And so, therefore, we must respond. And how is it that we respond? By living on our therefore. By living out our calling. By walking our walk in a manner worthy or in step with what it means to be a child of God. Where we're called out to be different from the rest of the world in our outlook and in our behavior. Perhaps another way to think about this, as you look at that graphic up there, is that that first half in blue is really all about God's sovereign initiative. It's what he did for us out of his love for us, and that is what we place our belief in. And the second half in orange is how we're to respond to it all, how we live out the therefore. That's our behavior. Because as we've learned, God is always the first mover and we respond to him. It's never the other way around. And that's why that arrow up there is so important for us to remember because it helps us keep our theology straight. Otherwise, we tend to end up at one of two extremes, and we see this all over the church, especially in America. At the one extreme, we believe that we gotta behave. We gotta be good enough for God to love us. And so we place our faith all on us. It's all about how we behave and what we do. Or at the other extreme, because God saves all those who place their faith in him, then we can just kick back. We really don't even have to do anything. But both of those are really bad theology because we see here in Ephesians that God is the first mover and we respond to this. We need both of them. And that is why Paul urges us to respond. He says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. He is exhorting, encouraging, pleading that we might respond as he has. Because notice now, this is the third time in this letter that Paul reminds us that he is a prisoner. He's in chains, but he doesn't see himself as a prisoner of Rome, remember. Rather, he's a prisoner for the Lord because Paul knows who it is that he serves. He knows he's in bondage because he's responded to God's call on his life. He's walking in a manner worthy of of the calling to which he personally has been called. And that's why he's now urging the saints in Ephesus and us, the faithful in Christ Jesus, to respond in kind. Because Paul knows it's absolutely vital to God's master plan that we respond. And recall from our study in chapters one through three that God's master plan involves uniting all things in Christ, and he does that through his church, and that's why we gotta respond, because it's our calling as a church to fulfill our role in God's master plan. As believers, as members of Christ's body, as his church, and that's why our lives, they have cosmic implications. And it's also why we really can't breeze in and out in church whenever it fits our schedule. It really doesn't make any sense when we think about it, the way Paul is teaching us because if we truly believe the truth of Scripture, then we're going to respond. And we're going to behave accordingly. We actually won't be able to help ourselves. And that's why when we profess to believe in God and all that he says in Scripture for us, but then we don't behave in step with it, it's quite possible that we actually may not truly believe what we say we do. And that's something for all of us to spend a little time thinking about. Honestly, it's a bit of a head-scratcher that so many people across America in churches only show up 1.2 times per month. Or the crew that just shows up at Christmas and Easter, as if somehow showing up occasionally to shine a pew is going to get you some points here and there to kind of move you along in your faith. Or even for those who attend weekly but never actually get involved in God's master plan. John calls them lukewarm. God despises lukewarm believers because they're just pretenders. In fact, Scripture says God spits them out. So do you see how either we believe and behave in step with our belief, or perhaps we don't really even believe what we say we do? And that's why our motto around here is let's go. 
We have songs that Tyler's written for us to sing about it. We got it on signs all over the place around here because we want to be about the business of the kingdom, about behaving in step with our belief so that we can be a part of God's cosmic plan as he's called us to be, and not occasionally, but in all that we do, desiring to live out that commission to go and make disciples, responding essentially to Paul's exhortation here. So hopefully you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, all right, you got me, I'm in. So what is it that I need to do next in order to respond to this divine calling? Well, Paul tells us. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? We're to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And how? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So there you have it. That's your 2023 resolutions, straight from the apostle himself, and you didn't have to give up chocolate either, right? This is what we need to work on, because just imagine for one second how much would change around Beaver County if all 557 of those who call Four Mile Church their home behaved in all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Imagine if we were eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Think about how much would change in our own individual lives, among our families, in our neighborhoods, at the workplace, among our friends, if only we just behave, if only we'd live out our calling and step with the truth of what we profess to believe in 2023. Who knows, as Cammie just mentioned, might even beginning, be the beginning of a revival in Beaver County around here. So let's start now by just tackling a couple of these today, and then we'll chew on the rest of them next week. And as you read through this, I hope some of you kind of caught that first thing we're called to be, because you almost have to laugh. There's this word again, isn't it? Humility. So the very first response that Paul tells us and he lists here that we got to focus on is the same word that we wrestled with all throughout Advent. Some of us even banging our head against this thing because it's such a big thing, right? Because we learn during Advent this vital truth that God comes to the humble. As Isaiah 66 records, this is the one to whom I will look. He was humble, contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. That's our focus. Because as we said, we don't find instances where God's kingdom prospers among the proud. God isn't uniting all things in Christ among the self-serving and the self-righteous, though he works among the humble. Scripture is clear and consistent. Humility is to lie at the very foundation of our behavior. And that's why we've now permanently fixed our humble sign over the entry to the sanctuary. Now, you can't see it because it's on the outside, but that's so you see it when you walk in. And we put it up there as a constant reminder. In fact, we may even lower it from time to time whenever it's needed around here, right? We start seeing some high and mighty people, we'll just bring that thing and drop it down a little bit. Because our behavior, our response to what we believe, it all starts with humility. We can't move on to gentleness. We can't move on to patience, love, unity, or peace until humility takes hold in our lives. We learned that during Advent that humility means lowliness, a deep sense of one's littleness. It's been said that humility is not just thinking less of oneself, but rather also thinking of oneself less. That's a good way for us to envision what it means to have a deep sense of one's littleness. As C.S. Lewis writes, a humble man won't even be thinking about humility because he won't even be thinking about himself at all. It's the mark of a Christian. It's the very first test we must apply whenever we engage with the spirit of another person. Because if the Holy Spirit truly reigns in a person's life, there will be signs of humility. There just has to be. Remember, God only comes to the humble those who have a healthy fear of him. 
Now, to be clear, this doesn't mean that Christians will be perfectly humble people all the time. But it does mean when they're called out, they'll be very quick to humble themselves, to repent, to seek forgiveness, to forgive themselves. Because the more you live a life with a healthy fear of the Lord, the more you realize how multidimensional, how complex, and how elusive this issue of humility really is. So let's briefly just take a look at two dimensions of the many dimensions of humility. The first and most easily recognizable involves self-importance. So let's go ahead and just start by looking at ourselves. Do we somehow believe that we are superior to others? Take a minute with that. Do we believe that we're superior to others, that somehow in and of ourselves we're a cut above the rest, that our perspective holds particular value, perhaps by virtue of the family that we come from, our wealth, maybe the job that we hold, or perhaps even the position we have in a church. And even if we've been knocked down a few pegs recently, there's still this sinful bent within us that we almost immediately then begin to see ourselves as superior by virtue of that humbling situation we just had. Well, I just got humbled. Well, look at that. I must be good now, right? I got this all figured out. That's exactly what we do. And that's why this particular dimension of humility has got to be an ongoing struggle for all of us. And so we must engage in a constant battle against it, bending the knee when a brother or a sister calls us out. Now, the second dimension I want to cover this morning is equally as challenging. I call it the utility component. Economists speak often of utility. It's essentially the satisfaction we get from experiencing things in life. It's what drives the eventual choices that we make. So when you go to the grocery store and you're making the decision between an apple and an orange, you make that decision based on the amount of satisfaction you expect to get from one or the other. And as you can tell, it changes too. Like one day you may actually prefer an apple, the next day you may actually prefer an orange. So it's not necessarily constant. And you're probably thinking to yourself, so what in the world does this have to do with humility? Well, the way we view utility or satisfaction tells us a tremendous amount about our state of humility. And it's perhaps easiest to see whenever someone asks us to help them out. Because what happens? Well, utility theory says that we begin to compare the satisfaction we're gonna get from helping our neighbor out with the satisfaction we get from our next best option. In other words, our minds immediately begin to assess whether we gain greater satisfaction from helping our neighbor clean out his gutters or greater satisfaction from watching the Steelers game, sitting on the couch. Now, I think where most of you are gonna lend on this, right? But our response tells us whether we think more of our own satisfaction or of the satisfaction of our neighbors. And this is where we gotta be really careful. Because if we choose to help out our neighbor by virtue of some sense of obligation that we have, or maybe so that he'll owe us next time, that's not humility. Rather, humility will actually cause us to choose to help our neighbor even though we prefer to sit on the couch and watch the Steelers. And that's because we actually think more of our neighbor's satisfaction than we think of our own. So much so that it never even crosses our mind not to help out our neighbor because we truly have humble hearts, hearts that are in step with Christ's hearts, where serving our neighbor is simply a satisfaction we gain because it's all about glorifying God. And so the further down that sanctification path we walk hand in hand with the Holy Spirit, the more that humility begins to take a hold on our life and the more we begin to appreciate the seemingly limitless dimensions of humility. It truly is a lifelong challenge for all of us. And so with a healthy fear of the Lord, what are we to do? We ask, we seek, and knock for the strength to respond to humility in all that we do, but especially before Almighty God. So we are to behave first in humility and then second in gentleness. Now the original word used here is praudis. 
And of course, its first meaning is gentleness. That's the word you see up there. And gentleness means having a mild spirit. And as you know, gentleness is also one of the nine fruits of the spirit. I'm going to hold off on digging into that today because we're going to get into that in great detail next week. Because as you look at these different things Paul calls us to do, they're all manifestations of the fruits of the spirit. So we'll get into that next week. But this word also has a second meaning, which is meekness. And as we learn back in the Sermon on the Mount, meekness is all about inner strength. Remember, even though it sounds like weakness, it sounds like, you know, like being a pushover, it's actually quite the opposite. It connotes that inner strength. It's the kind of strength that can suffer a wrong from another person and not retaliate. Think about the kind of strength it takes for that. Because we often see retaliating as the tough guy thing to do. That's the way we look at it. But it actually takes a much greater amount of strength to hold back, to respond with gentleness. Now, Aristotle spent a lot of time on this particular word. And he described praudis, which is, you know, Paul's using a lot of this teaching from back then, as characterizing the mean between two extremes. And more specifically, Aristotle was focused on it in the context of anger, where it's never always angry and never, never angry. And this is important because we so often associate gentleness with someone who is generally of a mild manner or an easygoing disposition. But that's not the way it's used in the way Paul describes it. It's so much different than that. In fact, in Matthew 11, Jesus describes himself as both humble and gentle. He says, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And Jesus, of course, is the ultimate example of one who had the fortitude to suffer wrong without retaliating. And when you consider all that he endured on the cross, Jesus was anything but weak. He certainly wasn't a pushover. He also didn't walk around angry all the time. He even asked God to forgive those guys who crucified him. And he also wasn't never angry. He flipped over tables whenever the temple had become a marketplace. We can also learn from Jesus' example that a meek man seems to be angered more whenever others are wronged. But he isn't easily angered whenever he himself is wronged. Or to put it another way, he is always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time. Is that us? How does anger manifest itself in our lives? And there tends to be two different types of angry people. There's the angry person that gets just explosive and loses it, and then there's the angry person that keeps it inside. And we tend to, to kind of cast dispersions on the guy that blows up, but it's equally as bad to have it inside of us. And so can you imagine if all of that anger that we have in our lives, whether we blow up or whether we keep it inside, if somehow we were to resolve to deal with that this year, if in 2023 we resolved to make this something that the Holy Spirit works out in each and every one of our hearts. So we're going to stop there um, for today. We've covered the first two you see up there in gray. Next week we'll come back and we'll cover those um, three you see up there in orange. But I want to close by just emphasizing and reinforcing Paul's use of this transitional word, therefore. Don't miss words like that when you're in Scripture because it's amazingly impactful and you can see how it applies here. It's critical that he inserts it between belief and behavior because that is our call to respond. That's why that arrow up there is so important for us to focus on because it helps us remind ourselves that we're to live up to what it is we say we believe. We live up to our calling as God's adopted children, called to be his church, his chosen instrument, his plan to unite all things in Christ. It's cosmic, and we get to be a part of it. Almighty God, we thank you that you've called us as your adopted children to play a central role in your master plan to unite all things in Christ. Holy Spirit, would you strengthen us in humility, convict us to think of ourselves less, to acknowledge that everything we have came from you in the first place. Cause us to experience our greatest satisfaction in serving you 
and others first. Father, would you shape our hearts to be never always angry, but also never, never angry, as we display gentleness and exhibit inner strength to suffer wrongs without retaliating. May we resolve to spend 2023 responding to what we believe. For Jesus' sake, amen.